tonight we are going to be speaking specifically on healing. So um, one of the things I got to watch is I'm a notoriously long speaker if I'm not careful because I throw so many testimonies in. And so I tried to save a few of the testimonies and share them tonight. Um, and there's always new ones coming along. I shared a brand new one um, about the man last weekend. Um, but I'm just going to share with you a few of the ones that have really impacted me over the years and some of the ones that will build some faith tonight. Um, so one of the reasons I share testimonies, the two reasons, is number one, that sharing testimonies and sharing about what God does is it gives glory to God. God. And it shares about who he is, it shares about his character, and it shares about his nature. But number two is that it builds faith. Because if God did it for another person, guess what? He'll also do it for you. And so that's the reason I share testimonies. And so one of the very first testimonies that I encountered, and this is going to be important because it's going to speak to God's interest and ability to use you to pray for the sick. And so I was in Malaysia. It was my very first crusade I had went on. I'm going to be honest. I was in way, way over my head. Um, I had flown across the world to be there. And I don't know what I expected, but whenever I walked out on the crusade field for the first time, I saw a bunch of people in wheelchairs, and I panicked. And I was like, oh, my God, there are people in wheelchairs, and they want to get healed. And so that next morning, I shared with the guy who was running our team, and I said, I didn't expect to see that many people in wheelchairs. I panicked a little bit. And he said, well, what did you expect? you think we were going to be praying for headaches and stubbed toes? And I was like, honestly, I was kind of hoping to warm up with some stubbed toes. That would have been wonderful. Um, but listen, that trip, I remember, so I, I struggled because I, I just didn't understand it. I didn't know what was going on. But the very last, the very last day, there was this elderly Malaysian woman. She was probably in her 80s. Um, and um, she couldn't move, she couldn't walk, she was kind of confined to a wheelchair, not because she was paralyzed, but because her knees were so badly damaged that she couldn't walk. Um, she had been, a, she had been a, a Buddhist her entire life, um, and so we come up to her, and I ask her, I said, is, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? And she said, no, but if he heals my knees, he will be. And so this morning, we talked about that God will respond to doubt with power, Amen. And so we laid hands on this woman, I prayed for her, and nothing happened. And so I like to share stories like this as well, is because I want you to know that when you pray for the sick, it doesn't always look like batting a thousand. Sometimes you're going to have some moments where it's going to attack your faith, that it's going to attack you, and you're going to say, well, what happened? Why didn't they get healed? And there's going to be a, you know, a story, and a couple stories I'm going to share are going to sound like that tonight. And so this woman, we prayed for her, and nothing happened. And so the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I want you to have the interpreters lay hands on her. And so I looked at my two interpreters, and I said, listen, the Holy Spirit told me he wants you to pray for her instead of me. And so they laid hands on this woman, and after they prayed for her, she shot up out of that wheelchair and danced. <laughs> and she's saying stuff in Mandarin that I have no idea what she was saying. And I look at my interpreters, and I said, what is she saying? And they said, she's yelling, all the pain is gone, all the pain is gone. And I said, well, lead her in the salvation prayer. Talk to her about Jesus. And so they talked to her, and she accepted Jesus on the spot. And so there's a couple things I want to pull out of this story, some truths that I want to pull out. Is Number one is that, like I said this morning, that healing is the dinner bell for salvation. That mir the miraculous is the dinner bell for salvation. Because the reality is this. There is no other God that heals the sick. There's no other God that casts out devils. There's no other God that sets free the oppressed. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. So you will spend your entire life encountering a Buddhist God who does nothing. But when you encounter the God of the miraculous, it changes things. But number two, the second point I want to pull out of this, this truth, is the interpreters looked at me afterwards and they said, God used us too? We thought you guys were special. And I wanted to tell her, I was like, if you knew exactly how not special I was, you would not be impressed. But the reality is that God wants to use you too. A lot of times we think we have to wait for the man of God. We have to wait for the evangelist, the prophet, the apostle, the whomever. You have to wait for your pastor. But the reality is the power of God is accessible to you at any time. Tonight is going to sound a little bit more like a teaching. I may, get, I may raise my voice a little bit. I may get a little bit excited. But I want to teach you some truths tonight. Because the reality is this, is oftentimes what keeps us from being able to receive from God is for a lack of knowledge. Is that we have a misperception about who God is. How many of you have ever encountered somebody that, you know, um, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, 
encourage everyone to admit that they've been a recipient of gossip. But how many of you have ever had someone tell you something horrible about someone else? Oh, yeah, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, they're horrible. And they tell you all these horrible things, and then you meet them, and you're like, wait a minute. They must have not just liked them because this guy's awesome. This woman's awesome. And so you receive all these things, so then you go to meet this person, and what happens is you're like, well, I'm going to you know, kind of give them a little bit of the Heisman here. Listen, you guys, you Razorback fans, you guys don't know what the Heisman is because you guys don't think it's one one, but... Oh, I had, to, I had to slip one in. So the Heisman in this award that really good college football players win, Ohio State has a couple. But you kind of you, you give them one of these because you're like, I don't know who they are. But oftentimes the enemy will lie to us about the character and nature of who God is, and it keeps us bound because we don't go to God. Because he will lie to us about God. I shared about that man this morning that had been hit by the IED. The enemy had been filling his mind with the idea that it was his fault that he had gotten hit because he had been in the military and so that God wasn't going to heal him. That was absolutely a falsehood because God was going to heal him. And once that lie was broken off of his life, what happened? Boom, instantly healed. And so oftentimes we receive these lies as truth. But here's the, the crazy part is that the devil is a liar, always has been, always will be. It says that he is the father of lies and there is no truth in him. But sometimes we hear those lies and then we just believe them, which is crazy to me, but I do it too. And I receive them and then I'm like, why in the world did I believe that load of baloney? I told a lady, a lady last week and I said, you know what you can say? You can literally tell the devil to shut up. Which funny thing is I shared that with the pastor. I'm like, oh, my mom thinks shut up is a bad word. She thinks it's a dirty word. I said, well, if you only knew, the first time I ever encountered someone who was demon-possessed, had no idea what I was doing. I was in El Salvador. This lady manifested, falls to the ground, gets up, growling, screaming. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, I look at her, and I was like, shut up in Jesus' name. And it did. It was laid back down. I was like, okay, I've bought some time until I get someone over here who knows what they're doing. And I told my prayer team partner, I was like, hurry and go get Scott. He knows what he's doing. But I know that I can tell the devil to shut up because I told it to shut up that day. Listen, when the enemy comes to you, and that's what he'll do. He'll come to you and he'll lie to you about God, about yourself. I shared with someone this morning that one time I felt a big lump on my neck. And what's the very first thing the enemy spoke to me? Oh, it's probably a cancerous tumor. The reality is it was just like an abscess that needed that needed popped or I needed to take some medicine for it to get rid of it. But the enemy will tell you the worst possible thing about yourself and about God. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to dispel some lies about God. And then what we're going to do is once we dispel those lies, we're going to take the gap where those lies used to be. We're going to build it with truth. And then we're going to pray for the sick tonight. Because once you have that truth, it allows you to come to God in a way where you're going to be able to have real faith. So the first lie is this. <clears throat> going to say, I hope my iPad didn't turn off, is that God doesn't heal anymore, or that a sickness is too big for God to touch. Oh, well, you know, God heals some of those little things, but I've got something really bad, and it's just too big for God. The reality is this. It says in Isaiah 53, 5, that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and that by his wounds we are healed. So that was a prophecy written by the prophet Isaiah that says, listen, this future coming king, this is what's going to happen, is that by his wounds, the wounds that were on his back, it says that his back was made to be a plowed field. It says that he was beaten beyond human likeness, marred beyond human likeness. That was the kind of pu the punishment in the beating that he took. His skin was ripped open. His, his flesh was flayed open. All of his blood was poured out. He did that for us. It's by those wounds that were healed. It says in 1 Peter, the funny thing is you could say, yeah, well, that's just a prophecy from the Old Testament. But we see in the, in the New Testament in 1 Peter that it confirms it by saying, by his stripes we were healed. And it points backwards, even the direction of the wording is saying, listen, that Old Testament prophecy pointed forward saying there's a day when it's coming. And then in 1 Peter, it points back to the day it happened. The moment that Jesus was crucified on the cross, that was the central point in all humanity when everything changed. 
Every prophecy pointed forward and every word in the New Testament pointed back to it. That was the pivotal pinnacle moment in human history. So if we're answering the question is, does God still heal? Yes, he unequivocally does. His power never changed. We talked about that this morning. The same God who said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, that same God who was in Luke chapter 4, was in Luke chapter 7, was in the 1950s, was in the 1990s, and is alive and living and active today. That power never changed. There is no sickness too big for him. I have seen people delivered from impossible situations. Last year, I was preaching in a, actually, it, it was a town that reminded me very much of Bearden. I was in a small town um, in central Ohio, and um, there was this woman that had come forward, and um, she came at the very end of the first service of a four-service revival, and she was red from head to toe everywhere, and it looked like she, had sh like she was shiny. And so when she talked to me, she said that she had had a condition for 15 years where all of her skin would peel off her body in a constant state of peeling, and that she was in incredible pain from it. It had been so bad that they had even had to remove her fingernails and her toenails, and that they had replaced the skin from her eyelids with skin from her arms. She had had it for 15 years. She had went to um, Cleveland Clinic. She had went everywhere looking for an answer to what ailed her, but she never found one. And so she reluctantly came up to get prayed for. We prayed for her, but guess what? In the moment, nothing happened. But she came back to me the next day, and this is what she says. She comes up, she said, you broke me last night. And I was like, huh, like a horse? And she said, exactly like a horse. She said, on my way home last night, I got in more pain than I was before you prayed. And I was like, well, that's exactly what a healing evangelist wants to hear. And she says, no, but when I got home, I went to take my pain meds, and when I sat on the couch to take them, I realized that all my pain left. All the pain I've had for the last 15 years, it was gone. So I waited, and I didn't take the medicine. And then I woke up this morning, and all my pain is still gone. And she said, I noticed that my skin doesn't itch anymore, and then it looks like it's starting to change colors. And sure enough, her arms were starting to turn back a normal shade. I got word from the pastor several weeks, uh, several days later after the revival was over, and he saw her, and her face was starting to turn peach colored again. That the thing that she had thought was impossible, the thing that the, the doctors told her was impossible, was possible with God's power. It is not too big for the reach and the touch of God. There was a young lady, um, and some of these stories are in my book, some are not. Um, there was a young lady um, who. I was in North Dayton. I wasn't even preaching. I had a friend who loved him to death, but he's a blowhard. He is, and he goes, hey, will you pray for my niece? I said, sure. And he goes, hey, bring your daughter over here. He goes, this is my friend Ryan. Every blind eye he prays for opens. And I was like, whoa, I don't want to get struck dead in the back of this church, number one. And number two, that is not true. I have seen a lot of blind eyes open. And so they shared with me that this, young, that this young teenager, this young girl, that she was blind in one eye and that the doctor said she would never see out of it again. We prayed for her eye three times and nothing happened. Now what happened is she left and I got word on Facebook that three weeks later she was in the, the, the doctor's office. She was in the office of the doctor who said that she would never see again and her eye opened up and she started to see color and shapes again. And they said that the doctor did a little dance in the room. And so I said, when I saw this, we have a God that can even make the doctors dance. <laughs> Listen, it does not matter what report man gave you. When the power of God touches you, the impossible is made possible. The second thing I want to point out of that while I share that story is every testimony I share is shared with intention. So not only do I want to point out that God can do the impossible, but I also want to point out that we have to be comfortable with God doing things the way that he chooses to do them. The reality is this. When she didn't get healed in the back of that church, it did not change my faith at all. Not a little bit. You know why? Because I know God opens blind eyes. And then the reality is God knew he was going to open her eye three weeks later, so it really didn't have an impact on her. But what I, my response is this. God, I don't know why you didn't do it right now. And I told that young lady, listen, I don't know why it didn't happen right now, but God has a divine tapestry. 
and he does things in a way that brings the most glory to his name. How much more glory was given to God by it happening three weeks later in front of the man who deemed it impossible than it was for God to have done it right there? I'm okay with God doing things in a way that brings the most glory to his name because he knows the beginning of things from the end of things. It's what Ecclesiastes said. And at the end of the day, I'm okay with submitting myself to the way he does things. Amen? The second question I want to deal with, we've addressed, can God heal? Yes, he can. The next point I want to address is, is it God's will to heal? And so this is one of the big ones that I get. This is the one I get the most pushback on because my belief, and I'm going to defend this belief here in a moment, is that it is always God's will to heal. And the response I get every time, I've gotten it from pastors, I've gotten it from congregants, I've gotten it from everyone, is they always come back and say, well, yeah, but what about my great aunt Susie who had cancer we prayed for and she died? But my response is always this. We base our doctrine and our belief in God what we believe about him, we base it on the word of God. We don't base it on opinion. We don't base it on experience. Now, experience can be a secondary source, but it has to support what the word says. And so when I look and I say, okay, is God the healer? I look at his word. It says that faith, uh, a popular minister I used to listen to, says that faith begins where the will of God is known. That if you want to have faith, you have to know what God's will is. We know God's will by reading his word. And when we read his word, here's what we find, is that Jesus was the only sermon that God needed to preach. How do I know that? Because it says that he was the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. It says that he was the image of the invisible God. Meaning that when Jesus walked the earth, everything that he did was a direct reflection of God. He even said, he said on four different occasions in the book of John, Something to the effect of, and he said it in different ways, that the things that he was doing was the Father's will. He said, I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Everything I'm doing, I've seen the Father do it. So we have to ask the question, if it's always God's will to heal, healing is God's will, why do some people not get healed? It's the biggest question I get. We have to take our understanding of what the word will means. The word will is God's express intent and desire. It says that it's God's will that all men be saved, but do you believe there are people that will burn in a sinner's hell? Yes. Although it is his will that they would be saved. But there are things that we allow in our lives, there are things that can keep us from receiving the fullness of what God wants for us. I one time met a woman, I was going down the healing line, and one of the biggest things that can keep someone from receiving healing in their body is unforgiveness. Because it says that if you don't forgive others, God can't forgive you. And if you're not forgiven, you're cut off from all the access and everything that comes with the atoning work of Christ. But I'm going down the line, and the Lord speaks to me, and he says, I can't heal her because of her unforgiveness. And so I come up to her, and this is one of my favorite stories in all of ministry. I go... Who haven't you forgiven? <laughs> and she goes, my husband. <laughs> and I said, she goes, I've been sitting here the whole time you've been praying for people, saying, I forgive him, I forgive him, I forgive him. And I said, yeah, but did you really mean it? I said, the Bible says they honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. Was that honoring God with your lips and your heart was far from him? She said, yes. And I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back down the line. I'm going to pray for folks. Whatever you got to do between now and when I get back to you, go get it right between you and your husband. God's will is his express intent and desire, just like it is for salvation. But just like with salvation, there are things in our lives that can keep us from receiving everything God has for us. I prayed for a woman once that I had prayed for on multiple different occasions, not just all in one sitting, for her to be healed of an issue could not get her healing on the fourth time I asked God I said God what's going on and he said there's something I've asked her to quit watching and she's refused and so I said God says there's something there's something that God's asked you to quit watching and you've refused and she said well I don't watch filth and I said well I didn't say you did and she said I said but God says there's something and she goes oh yeah, God told me to quit watching Criminal Minds, but I kept watching it. 
And I said, well, that's what it is. I said, you're pursuing the God of life while you're consuming something that glorifies death and destruction. And I said, you have bitter and sweet water coming in and going out. It doesn't work like that. You need to get rid of that bitter water if you want to drink sweet water. And so there are things in our life, and I say this because I never want to be condemnational because my next point is this, is that God doesn't make you sick. There are people that will hold on. This is the third lie, so I kind of transitioned into that. Is there are people that will receive and believe a lie that God made them sick. I one time encountered a man who um, he had AIDS. And I said, well, brother, I said, let's, let's pray for God to heal you. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, um, I lived my life for decades as a gay man. And he said, this is God punishing me for living life gay. And I said, were you redeemed and living free of that lifestyle now? And he said, oh, yes, God saved me. And I said, well, then God will heal you. He will deliver you. And he's like, no. He said, no, this is my punishment. This is what I have to live with because of that. Now, don't get me wrong. There is reaping and sowing in this life. The Bible says it. But the reality is that sickness does not come from God. It says in John 10.10 10, that the thief comes to steal to kill and to destroy but i i being jesus have come that you might have life and have it in abundance and so if we want to look in our life and find out what the root of something is we look at the fruit of it so if there is a fruit of death destruction and thievery in your life you can be certain that the root of that fruit is the enemy but god comes to bring abundance to your life that fruit is from him. The reality is this. We live in a sin-cursed world. It says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. That this is his realm. And he's in authority over it. Now Jesus came and he took the keys to death in the grave. And he spent three days in the belly of the earth like the word says. But the reality is we do live in Satan's kingdom. And as part of that, he attacks humanity. He attacks our bodies. He attacks our health. Sickness does not come from God. It says in Acts 10, 38, it says that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Acts even lays out for us that sickness is an oppression of Satan. Why is this truth important? Because... If you go to God and you go to him for healing, if you believe that he gave it to you, how could you possibly go to him and ask for him to heal your body? You can't. Here's the thing. If God authors something, Jesus honors it. Jesus did not come to break the back of something that God gave. He came to break the back of the powers of darkness. So if you believe that God really gave you something, how are you going to come and ask God, Jesus, hey, could you go get rid of the thing your father gave me? No, absolutely not. Can God allow things in your life? Absolutely. This morning I shared my testimony where God took his hand off my life and sickness entered my life, misery entered my life, everything entered my life because I was outside of the will of God. Now I want to tell you this, and I, again, it's going back to condemnation. Is When you hear this, if you struggled with sickness for a long time, I don't want you to sit here and think, oh, well, I must be outside the will of God or I must be a dirty, rotten sinner. That's why this is happening. No, the reality is sometimes we get sick and it says that every man is appointed a time to die. The reality is none of us make it out of here alive unless we get raptured, of course. So none of us are going to make it out of here alive. That's something we got to keep in mind. But I want you to know that God did not make you sick. Sickness is absolutely an oppression of the devil. The last point I want to make is, <clears throat> does God want to heal you? Someone spoke to me this morning, and they even said, they said, well, yeah, you know, I, I know that God heals, but, but does he really want to heal me? See, oftentimes we operate in an orphan spirit, and so we have a hard time understanding that God is our Heavenly Father who loves us. And so when we operate in that orphan spirit, the, ideal that God, the idea that God would want to heal you almost seems foreign to you. Like, why would he want to heal me? Why would he want to touch me? Why would he want to deliver me? One of the most important things that I had to learn was the heart of God for people. Because the reality is this, I'm going to be real transparent with you, is when I started going on crusades and I started praying for the sick, 
I can promise you it wasn't because I loved people. <laughs> when I did it, honestly, I did it because I thought it would be really cool. <laughs> I was like, man, can you imagine what it would be like to see blind eyes open? Can you imagine what it would be like to see somebody get up out of a wheelchair? My main motivation was purely because I thought it would be cool. I was even thinking to myself, man, that would be so dope if that happened. For those of you who don't know, dope is a term millennials use to mean cool. I'll translate for you. I joked with Caleb last night if he was going to translate from Yankee to Arkansasian for me. He said no. I thought I could depend on him. I lost where I was. It's beautiful, isn't it? But the reality is this, is that God wants to heal you. He loves you. And the most important thing is understanding the heart God has for you. I remember one of the very first times I preached somewhere that wasn't the youth group that I pastored. And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, see, I thought I understood God's love. But those teenagers love me back, so that's why I love them. But I remember standing there, and I was like, oh, no. God, I don't love any of these people. I don't even know them. And I had a really rude awakening with God that I didn't love them. And I was standing there, and I started pacing, and I started to panic because I understood that loving people was important. I just didn't understand why I didn't love them. So I started pacing. I was like, God, what am I going to do? And I remember there was a man standing in the front, and he was crying out, and he said, Oh, God, please heal me. He said, I know you're my healer. He had several obvious physical disabilities in his body, and he said, God, please heal me. Please heal me. I know you can do it. And in that moment, my heart was broken. Because I thought, man, he is desperate. The reason God heals people, the reason God heals is because he loves. See that word where it says, those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word saved is sozoed. Okay? That's a Greek word. And it means saved from every molestation and attack of the enemy. If you look at the Greek, part of the meaning of the interpretation of the word is to be made in perfect health. So if you would add that in, it would be those who call the name of the Lord shall be made into perfect health. See, but when we look and we see why God sent Jesus, it says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Why did he send his son to die on the cross? Because he loved the world. And if healing was included in the cross, guess what? He sent his son to die on the cross so that we could be made in perfect health because he loved us. That's the reason that he gives the gifts of God. Is number one, they point to who he is. But number two, is there an expression of God's love for us? I was praying for this young lady um, in Cincinnati uh, last year. And um, she had come up with back pain and knee pain, and her leg was stuck like this. She didn't tell me the whole story. I didn't know, so we just prayed. Her leg was stuck, bent like this. She couldn't extend her leg all the way out. And so we prayed for her, and God radically healed her leg, and she started bending it. And I was like, praise God. And then she told me the whole story. She didn't have a kneecap. She had had like a radical surgery in her leg because she was in a a really bad accident. She was going to lose the leg, so they had to merge everything. God had regrown a kneecap in her leg. He had done a creative miracle. And I have a picture where she's literally standing there weeping. And she told me the story afterwards. She had recently <clears throat> come out of a le- gotten saved and come out of a lesbian relationship like three months prior. She said, my partner left. I'm straddled with the weight of parenting a child by myself. I'm straddled with the weight of trying to figure out how to make my house payments. I'm straddled with the weight of trying to figure this out, and I feel like I'm drowning. She said, I thought I got saved, and then God had left me. She said, but I realized tonight that God didn't leave me, that God didn't forsake me, that he still loves me because look what he did in my body tonight. She was at the end of her rope, and God came in and said, let me show you again and remind you how much I love you. 
See, it says in Matthew, it says that he looked on the crowds and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd and they were abused and tormented. It says in Matthew 14, 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. The motivation for healing them was not because he had to. The motivation for healing them was not because he's like, well, I got to go do what God sent me to do. No, the motivation for healing with them was love and compassion. God loves you and he has compassion on you. If you don't have that knowledge hidden deep in your heart, you can't go to him like a father and say, God, give me what you already promised. See, because what happens instead is when we don't have that love and that understanding of his love, what we end up doing is we go to him one of two ways. Number one, we go to him with what I call an Oliver Twist prayer. Oh, God, would you just please just give me blank? Would you just please heal this? Would you just please heal that? And what it's like is we're like Oliver Twist going and begging for just a little more soup from an angry miser who doesn't want to give it. This God who's hoarding away all his healing power, and if you beg me hard enough, I'll give it to you. Or the other one, and this is the one I, I operated in for a long time, never saw results from it, so I don't know why I continued doing it, was what I call wrestler prayers. Like we're going to wrestle something away from God. Like we come with God with a contract and we say, God, this is your contract. This is what your word said. You've got to do it. You've got to live up to your end of the deal. And there was a, a, a doctrine that was taught a long time ago. Well, and it, and it is scriptural that you have to remind God of his word. But like he's forgotten. Like I'm going to go hound you down until you give me what I came for. Listen, you got to live up to your end of the deal. Listen, when I pray for you tonight, I'm not going to God like I'm a lawyer looking for him to live up to his end of the contract. What I'm doing is saying, God, give to them what I know you already want to give to them. Because the reality is this, is he wants to heal you more than you want to be healed. Which is hard to imagine. Because you know how bad that you want God's touch in your life. He wants to touch your life more than you want him to touch your life. That's why he was willing to send his son to be a ransom for all. That's why he sent his son as a ransom. He was willing. So here's the thing. I one time heard a minister say this, and it changed the way I looked at God. And he said, if you want to know how much you're worth to God, look at how much he was willing to pay to get you back. See, I am a little bit frugal. I have limits on what I'll pay for things. So what a store says something is worth, listen, it may not be worth that to me. If it says it's 50 bucks, listen, it may be 50 bucks to you, but it sure as heck ain't 50 bucks to me. There was a shirt that I really wanted, but it was $50. And I was like, I am not. It was a hoodie. And I was like, I ain't paying $50 for that hoodie. And then it got marked down to like 37 bucks. And I was like, you know, it's worth 37 bucks to me. I like that hoodie. And I'll even think to myself, okay, how many times will I wear that? Okay, X amount of times. That's about 50 cents a wear. That's a pretty good deal. What something is worth is what you're willing to pay to get it. Not what someone else says it's worth, but what will you pay to get it? So when you ask yourself, what are you worth to God? You were worth the death of his son. You were worth the beating of his son. You were worth his son pouring out all his blood and letting his body be broken. That is what you were worth to, the, to God. That's your worth. I had an encounter on my very first, my second missions trip, actually. I went on one when I was 19. But I went on one when I was about 25. And it was to the Dominican Republic. And the guy I was traveling with, the pastor, he said, here's what I want you to do. He said, we're going to be staying at a YWAM camp. And this is, this is the, I'm bringing the plane to a landing here. Are you guys tired of me talking? They're like, oh, yes. And so we're staying at this YWAM camp. And the pastor that I'm traveling with, he says, I want you to go and get watches. Go to Walmart. Get some cheap men's watches. Because a lot of these guys at the White Wing camp, they have nothing, and they love watches. Just go get them some watches. So we did. We all went to Walmart, got men's watches. But there was one guy on our trip named Dave. And Dave tells me, he said, I got one woman's watch. And I was like, oh, cool. He said, the Holy Spirit told me to get one. I got all men's, but I got one woman's watch. I don't know why, but he told me to get it. We're several thousand miles away from the Dominican. So we get there the very last day. I'm talking with this female missionary who lives there. She's from Dominican, but it's her home base, and she travels out to the Middle East to minister the gospel to Muslims. 
This woman is a woman who is mighty in power, and she has given her life for the call. And she pulls up her sleeve, and she says, do you like my new watch? And I was like, oh, that's nice. It looks cool. She said, Dave gave it to me. She said, I've been praying. I've been asking God for a watch for three months. I told him how bad I wanted a watch. And she said this. She said, I have such a good, good father. And it was in that moment my whole prayer life changed. Because I thought to myself, oh my gosh. If he cares that much about one child, that he says, if it matters to my daughter, Ada, that she has asked me for a watch, I'm going to send a man from 3,000 miles away. He's going to be in a Walmart 3,000 miles away. I'm going to speak to his heart, and I'm going to meet that need for her because she matters to me. Because I love her, and she has asked me for something, and I'm going to meet that need. But guess what? Here's the craziest part. Watches weren't provided for in the atonement of Jesus. There's not a word about watches in the Bible. When Jesus died on the cross, there was nothing about watches. If he was willing to go through all that for a watch, how much more so is he willing to do for the things that he already promised in his word? How much more so will he watch after his work to perform it for the things that he already promised to those who believe? That was when my opinion of God changed. That's when I quit going to him trying to wrestle healing away from him. That's when I quit going to him and trying to barter with him. That's when I quit going and begging for him to heal people. Because I understood for the first time. I thought I was just loving God. I thought I, you know, I love these people more than God. And I was going to barter with God for their healing. But the reality is he loves them way more than I love them. He wants to heal them way more than what I want to see them be healed. He wants to touch their lives way more than I want their lives touched. That's the opinion of we have to have of God. That is his heart for our life. My sister comes forward. I have seen God heal the sick all over the world. I've seen God sick, heal the sick all over the United States. And the thing that it comes down to every time is I know it's because of how deeply God loves them. Because he wants their heart. I prayed for a young boy. I prayed for a young boy, and I, I, I'm just going to share this. This is a little bit off the topic of healing, but it's important. I want to share it with you. I know I shared, I gave a salvation altar call this morning, and most everyone who's here tonight, I think, was here this morning. But I want to reiterate how important it is, how important salvation is. I prayed for a young boy in um, Dominican Republic, not the first time I went, the second time I went. And his name, his name was Alejandro, and his leg was broken in such a way that they didn't have the medical means to get it fixed, and it was broken at an angle. And so he walked like this. <laughs> And he didn't come. He didn't come with his parents. He heard the stuff, and he heard the stuff. We were in a baseball field, and he heard it from his house. And he showed up by himself. He showed up to the crusade. He responded at the crusade. He was maybe 11 years old, and he wanted healed. And I have never wanted someone healed more than I wanted Alejandro healed that night. My pants were covered in dust from sitting on the ground praying for his leg. This was just last March, and he did not get healed. And I want him more than anything for him to be healed. And the Lord spoke to me that night, and he just kind of stood there, unmoved. But the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Ryan, more so than I even want to heal his leg, is I want to heal his heart tonight. And he said, I want you to tell him that it's not his fault, and I don't know what it was, and that I want to make him smile again. This kid was carrying with him, just looked like the burdens of the world. And I looked at him and I said, Alejandro, through an interpreter, of course, because the last time I tried to speak Spanish, I'll tell you the things I said accidentally. If you want to know, ask me afterwards what the things I said in Spanish were. But I looked at him and I said, Alejandro, God wants you to know that it's not your fault 
And then he wants to make you smile again. And this little boy who we've prayed for the last 35 minutes and he was completely unmoved began to weep in that moment. Healing is wonderful. It's great. It relieves pain. It gives us hope. But the purpose of seeking the healer is so that he can heal our heart. God wants to set you free from the bondage of sin. He wants to set you free from the bondage of oppression. He wants to heal every part of you, not just your physical body. The reality is the scripture it talks about, it says it'd be better to enter heaven mangled than to not go. Talking about if your eye offends, you pluck it out. So I know that I'm taking that out of context a little bit. But there we even see the character of God, that he cares more so about your heart than he does anything else. And so if we're here tonight, we're going to pray for the sick. But I want to tell you, if you're in this room and you say, Ryan, my heart's not right. My heart needs healed and I want God to touch me. And I want him to save me. I want, I want to repent. I want you to come up and I want you to see me after service. And I'm going to lead you in the salvation prayer. I'm going to talk to you about salvation. And I want Jesus to heal your heart. The hurts, the things that you have not let go of. Because sometimes we have things that we refuse to give up. Because more so than anything else that he wants to do tonight is he wants to save your soul and he wants to heal your heart. So here's what we're going to do. I want to explain a few things to you as we pray so that you understand what's happening. So as we pray, there's a couple things that, and you'll see some of it out there on my little healing card, is when I pray for the sick, there's a couple things I do. Number one, I pray. Number two is I test because I don't believe in what I call drive-by prayers. So sometimes we pray for the sick is we pray and run. Because we're nervous, like we're going to pray and then God's not going to do something, so I'm going to pray and then I'm going to hightail it out of there as quick as I can. But listen, I am not, if, you, if we pray and nothing happens, guess what? My faith isn't shaken. I'm not worried because I know God's the healer. So no matter what I see with my eyes, you can't convince me he's not. Neither can the devil, neither can your symptoms. I've read the word of God, and I know who he is. There's nothing that convinced me otherwise. I prayed. I was at an event the other night, not even preaching, and a pastor friend of mine, they had this play in, and there were several members of the team that had different ailments, and I prayed for like three people with blind eyes right in a row. And these two young guys, I, I, I was talking to them, and they didn't get healed. And I told them, they said, well, we're sorry. I'm like, what are you apologizing for? I said, you could line 100 more people up that were blind in their eyes, and I'd pray for 100 more of them. It does not matter because I know who Jesus is. So we're going to test, and we're going to see if he heals you. So what I'm, when I say test it, is, and not everything is testable. So I'm going to ask you, okay, you had pain before. Do you have pain now? If you still have pain, don't tell me, no, it's 100% better. If it's 50% better, tell me. A drop of the miraculous is the miraculous, okay? So sometimes God will start a work and slowly progress it. I remember I was in El Salvador, and there was a young lady I was traveling with. And we came back from the crusade field. And this is one of, my favorite, one of my favorite moments. And she looks all beat up. She's like, just sitting there looking like her dog got killed, you know, one of those, just like somebody peeing her Cheerios. And I was like, what's wrong with you? She said, well, while I was out there tonight, and there's this guy, he was in a wheelchair. He'd been in a wheelchair for 20 years. And he got up, and he stood up, and he took a couple steps. But then he had to sit back down. And I was like, say what? She's like, yeah, but he had to sit back down. And I was like, it doesn't matter. He was in a wheelchair for 20 years. A drop of the miraculous is still the miraculous. If you had 100% pain and you've got 50 now, guess what? The miraculous at work is at work in your body, and he's touching and healing you. Grab a hold of it and don't let go. So if God starts a work in your body tonight, don't let it go. If you're praying for someone outside of here and it starts, guess what? Don't let go. Pray again. I prayed for people two, three, four, five, six times. You got to be really led by God if you're going to pray for somebody six times. I've only done it like once. It was this lady who was blind, and I was absolutely convinced. I was just like, Lord, they're going to end up stringing me up outside in the foyer of this church if I keep praying for this lady. I did. I prayed like six times, and on the sixth time, that eye opened up, and she said, I can see that face. And I was like, see what face? My face? She's like, no, his face. And normally, I only pray multiple times. That many times, if I'm seeing some progress, y'all, I didn't see a lick of progress. I didn't see nothing. She wasn't seeing colors, shapes, nothing. But God did it on the sixth time, which leads me to this. 
is don't be afraid to pray more than once. There was an old doctrine that came up in the Word of Faith movement that was absolutely faulty, and it was the idea that if you had to pray more than once, then you didn't have faith the first time. Poppycock, that's a load of baloney. Because Jesus prayed more than once, and guess what? He, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't lacking faith when he prayed. He prayed for the man that was blind, and it says that, it says that he saw men walking around like trees, and then they prayed a second time, and the man was healed. If Jesus can pray twice, guess what? We can too. So a couple of facts is when we pray, there are two key components that I point out. So I already said that we're not begging God to heal you. Also, I said it's God's will to pray. So if I hear anybody, and I mean anybody, say, Lord, if it's your will, I want you to heal my sister, I will hit you with my microphone. There are lots of things that we ask for God's will on. What house to get? Sure. What car to buy? Absolutely. Who to marry? You betcha. Healing? We don't have to ask God's will. We already know God's will. So if I hear you say, Lord, if it be your will, I'll hit you with my microphone, and then we'll pray for it afterwards. I'll have a ready-made healing line. We'll have revival. The next component, and then we're jumping right into this after this. Sorry, I'm giving you a lot of information, but I don't want you to just see it and I want you to take I want an inheritance I want something to be deposited in you that you can take with you is as you pray you're going to hear me pray several things number one you're going to hear me speak to whatever we're dealing with and rebuke it and bind it and command it to go okay so you'll notice that when Jesus spoke to the fig tree what happened he rebuked it commanded it to die and what happened to it it died there are other situations through the Gospels where we see that Jesus rebuked sickness and commanded it to go. The Bible says that whatever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You'll notice, and then, and hear my heart when I say this, because some people get wigged out, they don't listen to everything I say, is God never told us to pray for the sick. He told us to heal the sick. We are not asking God, God, please heal them. We are releasing what God has deposited in us. Okay? It says in Ephesians chapter 1, you can look at this yourself, it says that I want to open up the eyes of your understanding to the great power that is toward you who believe. That word towards, if you look at the Greek, it means inward as a dwelling. He wants to open the eyes of our understanding to the great power inside of those who believe. So there is a great power in you that God wants to release. So when we pray, I'm going to say, Lord, I release the power of your broken body and your shed blood over their bodies. There's nothing weird. There's nothing strange about it. Now, I will tell you is the power is not in the words. The power is in the revelation. The power isn't anointing someone with oil. The power is in the revelation. The power isn't in a prayer cloth. The power is in the revelation. The power is not in calling on the elders of the church. The power is the revelation that Jesus is the healer and he came to deliver you tonight. That's the power. Okay? That's the opening up the eyes of our understanding to the power in us. And so those are the two main components of what we're going to be doing is we're going to be binding, we're going to be rebuking. You'll notice that when I pray for people, I don't do backflips. I don't yell. I don't scream. I don't dance around. I don't play whack em and stack them. That's an old Pentecostal. Uh, we play this a Pentecostal game is whack em and stack them. Listen, it doesn't mean God moved if I get all of you on the ground. God can work with you standing on two feet. Now listen, he may want to come in and touch you with his power, and you may end up on the floor, and that's wonderful, and I'm glad he did it. But don't feel like you got to get on the floor for God to touch you. Okay? I did have a lady once. I told the pastor, so I probably should have somebody roaming around. I told the pastor, I said, listen, I don't see a lot of people get slain in the Holy Ghost. And sure as shooting, as soon as I said that, that service, this lady went down. There was nobody to catch her. There was, well, there was, but it was like a five foot seven, 75 year old man, and he got out of her way because this woman was every bit of six foot two and probably 250. And she went down and she had her head on a chair, and I was like, Oh, no, they're never inviting me back. And so I said, how's that woman? He goes, good. You know that was the pastor's mom, right? And I was like, oh, no. Why would you tell me that? I'm still praying for folks. And so the cool thing is this. 
we're about to pray for the sick, and we just laughed. Guess what? Healing does not have to be this ethereal, weird, supernatural like thing where we act like we're weirdos. Healing as healing and the gifts of God, guess what? They should be naturally just a part of our lives. I remember just a couple just a couple months ago, I was sitting at um, dinner with some family friends, and there was a woman there who I've known since I was a little boy, and her dad died probably nine months ago. And I was sitting there, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I want you to tell her that although she feels like she'll never be her again, that I'm going to come in, I'm going to heal every part of her heart, and she'll be her again. And we were laughing over, we were laughing over dessert. And afterwards, I said, hey, I want you to know, God just told me to tell you that although you feel like you'll never be you again, that God says he's going to come in and heal, he's going to heal every part of your heart. Guess what? That didn't happen at an altar. It happened over a dinner table at BJ's Brew House. And guess what? God's given you the power to walk in that every day of your life. You can walk in God's divine power. You can pray for people in Walmart. I pulled a guy aside once that had one leg short of the other and prayed for it to grow right in the middle of Walmart. I'm not sure who was more embarrassed, me or him, but you know what? We did. <laughs> and I told somebody once, they're like, isn't that embarrassing? I was like, yeah, it is. But God didn't promise you would never be embarrassed. <laughs> and he didn't. There had been plenty of times I've been embarrassed, but... He never promised me my pride. And so here's what we're going to do. Is if you have a physical knee in your body, as my friend plays up here. It's Johanna plays because I remember her name intentionally. As Johanna plays, here's what we're going to do. Is I've shared with you revelation and I've shared with you truth tonight. Now it's your job to respond. If you have a physical need in your body, we're going to pray for you tonight. And I believe that God is going to heal you. He's going to physically heal your body and make it new. And I said this morning that Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he wept because they missed their moment of visitation. Every opportunity that we have where we step into an environment where the Holy Spirit is there, we have an opportunity to respond to him. He's not going to force his way onto us. He's not going to force his way into us. The reality is that God has given each and every one of us a choice. Even onto the most essential moment in all humanity, when Jesus hung on the cross, he presented two men a choice. Will you receive him and will you believe or will you not? Now, at the end of the day, I can't force you to respond. I can't force you to believe. But I can give you the opportunity to respond to who Jesus is and let him heal your body.